Right. Um, today, it was not going to be a formal training, however. It's just really a discussion on the topic and some thoughts around um, some of the risks associated with Irish investment funds. That you might have seen was the um, advert inviting you all to today's session. Right, just to set the scene, um, I want to look at the scale of the Irish fund market. So um, we know that it's growing considerably at the moment and essentially a boom time for the investment fund market in Ireland. Um, from a global perspective, 17 of the top 20 global asset managers have funds domiciled in Ireland. Obviously, Ireland being a member of the EU um, provides full access to the European Union and its markets for the rest of the world, so that's very attractive. Um, we can see that about there's been uh, about a two trillion euro growth in the last 10 years in the, in the fund industry, so it's increased in size uh, rapidly. Uh, 5.2 trillion in euros in assets under administration. So that's not only Ireland's domiciled funds, but also funds from global places that are administered in Ireland. And we've seen a 25% growth in assets under management um, in 2019, and that's for Irish domiciled funds. So you can see that there are approximately 1,009 fund managers from 54 different countries which have their assets administered in Ireland. So growing market, um, obviously happy days for money launders potentially, and therefore a headache for the Central Bank of Ireland who has to regulate this industry. Um, the next slide is just a quick look at the growth in the assets under management in Irish domiciled funds. So that's taking you from a fairly low point in 2006 to January of this year, where the number of funds are 7,637 and um, net assets are over 3 trillion. So that's uh, quite a significant number of funds and, uh, and assets under management. Um, in Ireland, 40% of global investment fund services are, are managed in Ireland, um, as opposed to 60% in the rest of the world. So that's a rather large chunk and slice of the of the Irish of the fund market, rather. And Irish domiciled exchange trader funds represent more than 50% of the total European um, exchange trader fund market. So you can see it's absolutely enormous. Um, that introduces us nicely into what then is to be done about it in terms of regulation. So all fund services in Ireland are authorised and supervised by the Central Bank uh, of Ireland. Um, fund administrators and transfer agents, so all fund services in, in Ireland, um, have to be supervised and regulated irrespective of what their role in the, in the fund management process is. The fund administrators look at handling day-to-day -day operations of the funds everything except the investment of the actual assets themselves that, that lie within the funds. And transfer agents are particularly important from um, a KYC and anti-money laundering perspective because they tend to be the primary point of contact uh, for investors. So essentially what that means is that with funds in general, those investors um, that put money into the funds so they invest in these funds, um, they are not known um, to the other parties um, within the within the fund um, investment, and the only um, point of knowledge of those people are the transfer agents that will actually be responsible for performing the the KYC checks on these new investors, um, which are not otherwise uh, have to be disclosed in terms of their identity. Um, so it's really key that they have a good knowledge and proficiency of the regulatory requirements um, applicable to the fund industry, and particularly in Ireland. Um, and, and notably that they understand the relevant regulations. So from the, from the Irish perspective, from the central bank, um, which obviously stems from European directives, and also um, they are required to follow the guidance that's issued by the, by the central bank as well. Right. So fund managers um, have to comply with these and they're very strict regulations. So the fund business in Ireland is highly regulated um, by the central bank. Um, the legislation, obviously, as I've said, stems from um, the money laundering or uh, well, directors from the European Union, um, as well as um, being um, installed within Irish law by, by the central bank. 
And the central bank has also issued guidance, which must be followed as well. So these are not per se legislation, but it's guidance that must be, must indeed be followed. Um, I had a look at some of the, uh, the guidance that the CBI has issued, and one is on the, their relationship with the, the CBI and their responsibilities in that regard. And I'm not going to go through any of these, it's just for your interest if you'd like to go and have a look at them there on the CBI website. Um, the second one is on fund administrators outsourcing, which is quite interesting. And the third one is on their own funds risk assessment and capital planning for fund administrators. Um, the central bank does actually enforce fines for failings in these um, to comply with these regulations and the guidance. An example below was JP Morgan Administration Services was actually fined 1.6 million in June uh, last year for serious regulatory failings. And these essentially came down to the fact that they had not um, followed the rules in terms of outsourcing their fund administration activity. So it's all very well um, to have a fund administrator um, or a transfer agent looking after um, your funds and managing them, but they have to follow the rules. And that's in order that the central bank can regulate and supervise them properly and ensure that they are following um, the anti-money laundering counter-terrorist financing rules and guidance. Uh, this was the first time that the central bank actually fined anyone for outsourcing breaches. So that's quite interesting in itself to note. And we'll have a quick look at some of the um, important fund types in Ireland. So bearing in mind that um, these are tend to be regulated funds, as I've said to you, that it's a highly regulated market. Uh, the CBI has strict rules in terms of how one may uh, invest in funds and how one may manage one's uh, funds. So looking at the two most important fund types within the Irish market, we have um, authorised, so they are all authorised, investment funds um, are either known as USITs or non-USITs, and those are what's known as AIFs. So a USIT is an undertaking for collective investment in transferable securities, and if it is not one of those, it is an alternative investment fund. I'll look at them in a bit more detail on the next slide. Um, but just looking at, again, some, some data around that from the Central Bank, they've said that USITs domiciled in Ireland had 1.8 billion in assets under management, which actually accounted for 75% of the Irish fund market, while non usits had 611. So that there is quite a big difference in terms of, um, you know, the number of, of, well, the amount of funds that are actually set up as usits. Sorry, so that's 1.8 trillion then, actually. So I've just mentioned that to you. And in fact, we can see the, the pie chart on the right hand side on the following slide here showing Irish dominant domicile funds. And that's looking at the difference between USITs and non usits over there. Um, but a big slice of the, of the Irish fund market is also clearly in, um, in USITs. So just taking a quick look at some of the um, underlying features of those funds, we've got um, USITs that were actually introduced by European Directive in, in 1985, and that was essentially to facilitate what was known as the cross-border distribution of collective investment schemes. And they did that via European passporting system. So obviously you have to be a member of the European Union in order to um, use that, to utilize that privilege. Um, but that was the idea of it, to make it more accessible to other people across, uh, other investors across Europe. It was initially designed for retail customers and therefore had sort of appropriate levels of protection built in um, because of that. Um, some of their features mean that it must be open-ended and liquid. So by open-ended, that means that new investors can continually come and invest in those funds. It's not closed to a certain number of investors at all. And it's pretty flexible in that it can accommodate sort of a wide spectrum of strategies and asset classes. Um, they usually tend to be um, exchange trader funds or um, money market funds, which we'll have a look at um, in the next slide as well. Um, alternative investments funds, so non usits um, are actually subject to the requirements of the Alternative Investment Fund Managers Directive, which is a European directive, and it essentially imposed, um, you know, conduct of business rules, organizational, operational rules, and, and um, requirements around transparency 
for the funds and the fund managers in particular in, in the way in which they, they manage their funds. So all of these things, if you, if you look at it, taken from the perspective that the fund management business in Ireland is, is growing, it's huge, but it is highly regulated and the, the Central Bank of Ireland supervises it quite strictly. Um, another form of investment um, or alternative investment fund there is called the Qualifying Investment Fund. And essentially that's just not for retail customers, but for larger professional investors, um, as it's not subject to such strict investment restrictions. Um, and therefore it could be quite appealing to money launderers. Um, obviously they expect you to, as in the way of Mifid as well, they expect you to be um, qualified, experienced, big, bad and ugly investor that you know what you're doing and you understand the risks involved, hence why it's not as um, restricted. Right, so here we have um, two forms of USITs, our exchange traded funds, and they're essentially traded like a common stock on the stock exchange. Um, more than 50% of all European ETF assets are traded in Ireland. Again, going back to the story of a very big percentage of the fund market taking place in Ireland. Money market funds are open-ended mutual funds. So I've explained what an open-ended fund is um, that invest in highly liquid short-term financial instruments. Um, and these also tend to be fairly low risk investments. Um, although in Ireland, money market funds can be established as either a USIT or an AIF, an AIF, um, non-USIT. All right, so I've given you a brief overview of the different types of funds, and I'm not going to go into any detail as I'm not a, um, an investment strategy fund manager myself. I wouldn't uh, be able to give you more detail. Um, but let's have a look at some of the money laundering risks that are associated um, with these funds. Uh, essentially, we thought that funds, because they were so highly regulated and supervised by the central bank, um, that they had a relatively low level of exposure to money laundering. Okay? The assets are primarily distributed by other regulated financial institutions, which give us an additional layer of comfort in terms of being regulated themselves. Um, they are all subject to restrictions on the amount of cash they can withdraw um, and all sorts of other restrictions on the movement of money. Uh, also, funds were primarily used for long-term investments, which means that there was no point in money launders trying to get a quick turnaround of their money. Funds had to be held and were not released um, upon agreement uh, and in terms of the fund strategy, obviously, for, for a considerable number of time, amount of time, so in, in essence, sometimes years. Um, however, we've started looking at the fact that uh, certain things have emerged now that lead us to suspect um, that the, the initial risk assessment is not as low um, now as we initially expected it to be. Um, as you know, money launderers are quite adept at always seizing the moment and coming up with new ways of, of committing crime and laundering their, their uh, dirty money. So we have to be on the ball and looking out for these things all the time. Because of the easy access of these funds to various investors, um, they can cover a very large market. So we're looking at um, you know, sophisticated money launders in this case that know what they're doing, that understand the markets and they know how to manipulate these things. And they definitely are out there. Um, another giveaway for us is that, that the huge amounts of assets contained in funds, so they can actually money launder large sums of money or launder large sums of money. And, and it makes it relatively easy for, for their illegal origins to be concealed. Um, and of course, criminals find new ways of, of doing this all the time. So taking um, illegally acquired funds and, and laundering it to make it look as if it was legitimate. All right, so in terms of looking at um, how to, to mitigate these risks, um, we've got a number of suggestions here. We've identified how, you know, where the money laundering risk might well be. Um, and now we're going to take a closer look at some of the um, the other aspects. So first of all, the nature of the relationship, that really um, boils down to uh, the capacity in which you are acting against uh, the, you know, your, um, your other opponent in, in, 
in the field of, of um, investment. So, um, for example, you would say you can either then trade in a direct capacity as principal, in which case you are aware of who you are dealing with and their um, identity is uh, known to you. Um, an agency relationship is obviously something where there is an agent trading on behalf of an underlying investor. And in the case of obviously in fund businesses, you won't know who the underlying investor is. So the identity is not known. Um, therefore, fund managers, when they are dealing with um, unknown and underlying investors, need to make sure that um, the administrator or transfer agent who is performing these checks on their behalf um, has good policies and procedures, standards in place for looking at performing adequate customer due diligence on the underlying investors and making sure that they are happy that there is no risk of money laundering in, in that way. Um, they also need to obviously make sure that they have um, controls in place to check for these things. Customer due diligence, we look at the second one, is a pretty obvious one, and that is looking at performing your customer due diligence check. So do you know your customer? And part of that is, um, you know, what is the ownership structure of your customer if it is not an individual? And, then, and where is the money coming from? So who controls the money? Um, you have to perform the checks. Where is your source of wealth um, and source of funds coming from? And that's um, basic stuff. So that would be the cornerstone of your um, AML controls framework, if you like. So you go back to your policies and procedures and um, come up with the right customer due diligence requirements to mitigate the risk there. Um, condition risk is, is something that is about the actual um, strategy of the fund and the conditions that exist around that particular fund. Um, some have um, more strict restrictions around access to the fund, investing in what they do, are reinvesting, that kind of thing. Um, and um, that is intrinsic to the investment strategy of that particular fund. Obviously, if, if the conditions are more lenient, uh, money launders will find that easier to manipulate the situation. Um, so that needs, to, um, that needs to be looked at from a business perspective when you're setting up the fund in the first place and, and try to understand if it will be um, you know, a good thing for money launders. <laughs> It'll be a, encouraging for them to do it and then find out ways that you can then try to put risk strategies in place for ensuring that they are not using those. So if where, for example, you have a quicker return of money, you have to then um, make sure that you have other controls in place that you've identified who they are, where the initial source of wealth came from, et cetera, in order that you can um, restrict that. Um, the value risk also relates to the amount of money um, which an investor can put into funds. So normally funds have a minimum investment amount. Um, and you can put restrictions in terms of the amount that can be invested. So where um, a potential money launderer is trying to, um, to launder large amounts of money, there might be restrictions in terms of how much he's allowed to put into a particular fund. And that is also one way of mitigating potential money laundering risks. Now, enhanced due diligence is another way that we can look at um, mitigating money laundering risks. And this is not something new. I mean, you will have all have heard of this. It's been in place for a long time through all of the money laundering directives that have come down from the European Union um, and been installed within Irish law. Um, I know you're still in the process in Ireland of putting in place the fourth MLD and the fifth one is clearly um, next to come in uh, and be promulgated within the national law. Uh, essentially, with enhanced due diligence, um, sort of the precept behind that is identifying where there are high risk factors present. And with funds, this will have to be specific to your particular business risks. So you will have to look at your business or your fund and what type of business strategies are they involved in, what type of investment strategies are there, and what are the risks particular to you and your investors. And then work out if there are high risk factors present. Um, and you perform additional checks where there are high risk factors present. Now, this, as I've said, has been in um, news to us for, uh, for a long time and therefore nothing new at this point. Um, enhanced due diligence, the point of which is to identify underlying owners um, where you have complex structures in terms of multiple 
funds, feeding other funds and investing in various sub funds, et cetera. That will need to be looked at in greater detail till you feel comfortable that you know where the money is coming from and who is behind it. Um, transaction monitoring, obviously, from this perspective, will also be um, a good way of looking at that, um, looking at whether transactions coming in and out of the funds are in keeping with the investment strategy of the fund and with the customer base or investor base that's involved there. Um, again, as I've said, this is very specific to your particular business risks and your type of businesses you perform. Um, you can also, by looking at that, come up with a, a transaction monitoring profile in terms of the types of transactions that you expect to see um, when you are, uh, you know, through the investment process of this particular fund and it has certain um, normal activity that you would consider to be okay. Anything that goes um, outside of that normal profile, you would expect to be flagged up and to look at in more detail. That would be a red flag for you. And essentially the most important way of, of looking at and managing your money laundering risk is having an effective AML governance framework. And, and this is also nothing new, but essentially tying in the whole thing together. Um, you need to make sure that from, your, from the beginning, you have the right framework in place to manage your risk. So identify your risks in the first place, look at your AML risk, um, tolerance levels, what are you prepared to tolerate and what is out of your tolerance, for example, um, making sure you have proper policies and procedures in terms of how you will deal with your AML and, and terrorist financing risk, um, systems in place to effectively catch any of these infringements, um, your, for example, transaction monitoring, your screening services, all of these require automated help in terms of system support to allow you to be better at ascertaining where there are things that fall outside of your, outside of your, um, your framework and your, and your risk tolerance. Um, the CIP, so your customer identification program and your customer due diligence requirements as part of that are an essential part of making sure you know your customer and you understand um, ownership where the money comes from and whether they've been involved in any high risk situations. So that's key. Um, again, things like ongoing monitoring is, is really important. And so you can't just look at it once, you have to perform monitoring on a regular basis, whether it's a periodic review of that client file or whether you then reviewing the profile from a transaction monitoring perspective to ensure that it's still the same or whether you need to change that profile. And then of course, general governance in terms of escalations um, at what point would you need to escalate to your compliance department at what point is it appropriate um, to to issue a report of a suspicious transaction um, those kind of things so essentially um, that is your most important recourse and and essentially for um, going back to the CBI as well so if they come in and do an audit of your business of your fund Will they be able to see that your control framework, your governance framework is in keeping with the risks of your business and is um, essentially reflecting a risk-based approach? So from that perspective, it's looking at your risk-based approach. What do you identify as your risks? What are your tolerance levels? And therefore, what controls do you have in place to make sure that those levels, the tolerance levels are, are not breached? Right, so in conclusion, we can say um, in order to mitigate one's risks and in general deal with the risks, money laundering risks associated with the fund business, you have to continually assess, develop and monitor your AML controls. As I've said to you, it has to be specifically designed um, to cater for the, the particular risks that are exposed um, to your business and in terms of the investment strategy the locations involved, uh, any other risk factors that you would consider relevant um, need to be catered for and, and wrapped up within an AML controls framework that would cater specifically for your business. A successful fund manager must consider all risks, of course, from an impartial perspective and look at uh, making sure that funds and investors are protected from financial crime. And that brings our short webinar to an end. I'd like to open the floor up to any, any questions and I will endeavor to ask them my colleague, 
um, Cameron McNeil will be available to help out with questions from a more uh, legal perspective. 